Good morning and welcome to Theology Thursday, the Bible study from Grace Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Wesley, and we are studying the texts for Holy Trinity Sunday, May 30th, 2021. And our icebreaker question is, what is your favorite number? My favorite number is the lucky number 13. Lucky number 13, that's my favorite number. And uh, I'm gonna popcorn over to Sandy. Good morning, Sandy. Good morning, Pastor. And th this month, my favorite number is 79 because I'm entering my 80s next month. So <laughs> I'm gonna go with 79. Very nice, very nice, congratulations. Okay, who do you popcorn to? Uh, Loretta. Um, well, mine is kind of a double number. It's 63, 64, because that's the birth age, age of my children. Wonderful. So, that, I don't know, we all have different reasons. So. Yeah. Okay, Ingrid, it's you. Pastor, today you're saying everything, pulling it out of my brain. Of course, for me, it's 13. I was born on the 13th, so. Yeah. It's always has fared me well, and people always get upset. Friday the 13th, I said, it's a great number. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's my number. Good. Good, good. Coffee, cappuccino, and the number 13. Yeah. <laughs> and my Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, our first reading is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Would someone like to read? <clears throat> I can read. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to press the continue button because it's okay. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voice of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The Lord. Be, thanks be to God. Thank you, Loretta. I, I love that last verse, and here am I, mm -hmm. send me. Mm -hmm. Here am I, send me. Exactly. It is a great one. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of equate it with Martin Luther's words when he said, here I stand. I can do no more, you know, so. Yes, that's a great connection. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that idea of being called, you know, that God calls, calls us to, to certain jobs and tasks. And how can you say no to God? Right. Well, we almost feel that way about you at times, Pastor, if you ask us to do something. Okay. Um, we feel that it's for the benefit of the church, but then, then we're willing to respond. Okay. Because we are the church, all of us. Amen. Amen. We are the church. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Thanks for saying that and, and not being willing to serve and yeah. Yeah. Once, once I had a pastor, uh, at one of the stages in my life and, um, if I had a, a voice mail, it was before voicemail, it was just a message on the answering machine. I didn't have a cell phone in those days. Um, 
I kind of had to think twice if I wanted to listen to it because almost always I was going to be asked to do something. <laughs> and like you, Loretta, it was, I knew I probably couldn't say no. So it was like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of our pastors, Pastor Wickstrom, moved in just down the street from me. He was like three houses down. And I, I faced a cul-de-sac. And whenever I would see him coming, I would think, oh, I wonder what he wants. <laughs> And I told him that we, you know, we did it lightly. I told him that I would say, "Oh, when I see you coming, I'm always thinking, no, I wonder what Pastor needs today." <laughs> or sometimes I call someone and they go, "Am I in trouble?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's that I think that's a feeling we all have, right? I mean, you know, pastors are just human beings, and um, but they are called to serve with a, a special job. And of course we, we try to do right. But, but this feeling of, um, you know, is one that we all share when somebody, you know, of, of authority, you know, is in our life and, and above all human beings, of course, God, you know, when, when God calls us, um, that's, that's a big deal. You know, and some, some people say, be careful what you ask for, you know, um, or like, you know, just that power of prayer when, when you <clears throat> pray to God for something, you know, it's surprising how quickly things can happen sometimes, you know, it's, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I had wanted to ask to the symbolism. Um, I understand the symbolism of, of the lips being mm -hmm. clean, the words being clean, but also for the angels, for the eyes and for the feet, um, you know, how they covered with their wings. And the wood feet seem to be unclean. Um, yeah. The symbol of feet was un unclean. Yeah, exactly. So the the wings are covering over the, the what is unclean the feet and also covering their face you know like Moses had to cover his face um after he spoke with God because he would just be mm -hmm. radiating you know right. and it's like that idea of being in the presence of God is so powerful that it you know you almost have to shield yourself and then two that flew Mm -hmm. And with two, they flew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So six wings, two of them, they fly, and four of them, they use to, to cover themselves. Mm -hmm. And that ties into the imagery of the, the temple and the mercy seat. Um, the Ark of the Covenant had two um, seraphim, I believe, with their wings connecting, and that was where God sat. And what's interesting is the prophet Isaiah says that he saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Just that part right there. What did the Lord look like? Hmm. And... What, was it like a vision? Well, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it is he's it is a hundred percent a vision, yes. But it just makes me think. Well, what did he look like? <laughs> um, or sh she? I mean, we're talking about God, you know, just beyond beyond our imagination. Um, and to think about the size of God, I had a professor in seminary that wrote an article about the how big is God? And it was a little bit of a tongue in cheek article, but he actually went through passages like this that, that described physical attributes and really tried to say, you know, how big God was. So like the hem of his robe filled the temple. Right. So if you think about a robe that you wear and how big a hem is, a centimeter, so if a centimeter filled the whole ancient temple, 
in Jerusalem, then how big would God have been? You know, again, you can't take it too literally, but it's just kind of fun to think about. In this vision, how big was God? Really big. And it does kind of make you think, what does God look like? You know, does God look like an old man? Of course, we, we think of Jesus, obviously, but, but then you think about God the Father and God the Son. Well, what, is, what does the Father look like, you know? What do you think? Anyone have any, when, when you think of God, do you have an image in your mind? Oh, we're all influenced a little bit by what we've seen, pictures. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and it, it would just be a kind face, very mm -hmm. kind eyes, very penetrating eyes. Um, and, and I, of course, with my limitations, I think of light skin. Say that last part again? Light, light skin, not, mm -hmm. not black, but mm -hmm. just light skin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's because we're, that's what we're exposed to mostly. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. In in in, our, in in your life, that's been you know the majority of people you've been around, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. All right. Any other thoughts on on God and? You know, it's, uh, it's Holy Trinity Sunday, so we're thinking about God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, shall we keep going? Okay. All right, Psalm 29. Would anyone like to read? I'll read. Okay, thanks, Sandy. <laughs> Ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord, you gods, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due God's name, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord bursts forth in lightning flashes. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying, glory. The Lord is sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. Lord, give strength to your people. Give them, O Lord, the blessings of peace. Amen. Thank you. Psalm 29. What do you think about Psalm 29? I think it makes the Lord look extremely powerful and comforting at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I agree, Sandy, and I think the comforting is his voice because out of those 11 verses, we hear it like six times, the voice of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and so that the voice of someone you love is comforting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we talk about Jesus being the word of God, which is kind of like God's voice. And so as, as the Lord speaks, you know, you have Jesus who is the word of God, the firstborn of creation, co-eternal with the father. And also the idea of the Holy Spirit, you know, being like the, 
the wind being like the wind stripping the forest bare. One of the things that's interesting about this psalm too is um, there's a there's a sense where you know things are happening in nature, like a storm maybe, the so a storm so powerful that you know cedar trees break, um, that the animals are skipping, uh, or actually a, a whole country skips like a calf, lightning flashes. Um, and while all this is happening, and in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. And it, you can almost imagine ancient um, Jewish people in the temple praising God while there's like a big storm outside. And they're crying glory, and, and the wind is kind of whipping around outside. You can just sort of imagine it. I think that would be quite an experience. We were joking around um, a few weeks ago, you know, it was so windy at church. Um, it, it was knocking over the umbrellas and the flowers, and I mean, just everything was getting blown over. It was, it was quite a Sunday. And, um, and we were not inside, we were outside. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was a challenge. And then little Abby, who just turned two, was not fearful of the storm. She walked right up to the front as the flower pops were flying. <laughs> yep. And just stood, and stood there. So mm -hmm. I, I sent her mother a picture of that because Abby has no fear. And she's very gregarious. And there she was with all that storm. And she was so teeny tiny that she could have blown over. <laughs> exactly. She, she, had, she was a, a, a woman of faith up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Courage. Yeah. The innocence of a babe. Yeah. Yeah. But that was true. Um, I was glad that Sunday. I think we looked at you and thought, hmm. Is he going to say maybe we better go home? <laughs> yeah. But but we held on to our chair and stayed. We made it through. And that's what makes being inside make us so thankful for now that we can do that. I and, and that speaks to this, right? The Lord gives strength to your people. Give them, O oh Lord, the blessings of peace. And when we gather and worship, cor corporate worship together, we are blessed. You know, God does give us strength. It makes a difference in our life. Um, and they've done scientific studies that prove this. People that make a worship a part of their life, you know, they really dedicate that time. It, it benefits. It benefits people in their life. You know, there's lower incidences of disease. There's, you know, it's shown that you... On, on average, you tend to live longer than if you don't. Not, not to say your life's going to be easy and there's not going to be hardship. But, but on average, when they study populations of people, people that go to church, they have strength. You know, the Lord gives us strength uh, when we go through the storms of life. It's just, um, it's, it's like a proven blessing. Mm -hmm. I believe that firmly, yes. Mm -hmm. That's why when people say, why is there so many old people at church? You say, because you go to church, you live a long time. You know? <laughs> good one. <laughs> and you have a lot, more, a lot faster. <laughs> and you have a lot more problems, too, so you have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need the peace and the yeah. strength really badly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a scary thought when I think I'm probably one of the oldest people in the congregation. Pat's a little older than I am, but um, it, it never seems, it never seems right when you're not in church on Sunday. The mm -hmm. day just doesn't seem right. Right, and then the whole week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So one interesting thing here, <clears throat> kind of a stewardship connection, this first word, ascribe to the Lord, can also be, 
uh, translated as give tribute. And so my, the same professor I mentioned earlier that talked about the size of God, he always made it really clear to us that in ancient times, um, there was no difference between religion and government, that they were the same thing, that the, the priests in the temple were, that was the central government. And so when you went to give your offering, you were also paying your taxes. Um, you were giving, so the king of a nation would get tribute, you know, and, and kings would tend to say that they were selected by God. You know, they would go so far as to say that they were God's son or daughter and to give, to, to pay tribute to God was to pay tribute to the king. And um, the way that this psalm is translated is um, indicative of that, you know, that we give tribute to God. Um, and then as we read in the Old Testament, you, you, you see a, a, a splitting where you actually then have a king separate from the priests. Um, and even fast forward thousands of years, now we live in a time with um, secular governments and the freedom of religion. You know, so it's just interesting to think how we progress as a civilization um, and, and understand, you know, taxes become a civic duty that we do for, you know, roads and bridges and military, you know, just things we need, infrastructure, and then um, giving to God becomes something more voluntary that we don't do out of compulsion that we have to, but something we do freely from the heart. Um, and that's just kind of cool, you know, to, to remember that and, and to think of um, how we're so grateful for everything that God has given us that, you know, like for Sherry and I, we, we practice stewardship and it's really a joy, you know, to be able to, to give, um, in, in a way it, it really makes, I don't know how you all feel, but when we give it, it, it really, it's almost, there's nothing like it really. I mean, to, just to be able to give, it's, it's just quite a, quite a wonderful feeling to give to God. Any, any reflections on that as you think about your own, you know, stewardship practices and whatnot? I always kind of think of the widow's might mm -hmm. in the story of the widow's might um, in scripture mm -hmm. and how she had so little, but um, she was so grateful that she gave the little bit she did have. We have many examples of it, but. Exactly. That's a great example, you know, where she, um, she, she showed generosity and, and her faithfulness to God and, and God recognized it, you know, each, each to their ability. So, so thank you, you know, thank you to each of you, um, for practicing your stewardship and, um, Nice, nice just connection here to the reading. All right, should we take a look at Romans? Does someone feel like reading? I guess it's my turn then. Okay, thanks Ingrid. <laughs> You're a good reader. <laughs> well, I'm reading this on Sunday, so. <laughs> okay, here it is, second reading, Romans 8 through 12. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit, you put the death, the deeds of the body. You will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, 
It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may be also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Thank you, Ingrid. You're welcome. Yeah, so what do we think about this reading from Romans? Well, it's full of hope. It's a little hard to comprehend each each verse, but um, I think it's a it's a hope. There's a lot of hope, full of hope and promise. Mm -hmm. What's well, kind of hard to really understand for me, anyway. Yeah, because mm -hmm. because uh, you know to live according to the flesh and not to the flesh. So the distinct difference, because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So what is meant by that? It's a good question. So human sins, you know, that we're all. So, you know. so this, this, the situation with Paul is that in a way he was, he was addressing, um, he was addressing racism. And I'll and I'll tell you I'll tell you why. So Paul was a missionary, and he, as you know, he was at first he was not Christian. He was anti-Christian. He was persecutor of Christians, and he then became a Christian by the Holy Spirit, just like all of us, right? It's the Holy Spirit that calls us to faith, and then he something about his personality and and god's calling sort of like isaiah here i am send me he was very influential in taking a movement that was um within a cultural group and you could even say a racial group and or an ethnic group would probably be the most appropriate term and then he extended it to everyone because Paul was a businessman, right? He was a tent maker. And like a, a good businessman, anybody could be your customer, right? You don't want to discriminate. Business is business. Right. right. And he took that into the church or to the, what was the new church? And he said, guys, there's people out there who need salvation. It doesn't <clears throat> matter what their ethnic background is. And that's what he means by not living according to the flesh. Because some people would say, well, that person's uh, from Rome. You know, they're, they're an Italian. They cannot, they can't be one of us. That person's from Ethiopia. They can't, they can't be one of us. That person's from Galatians. They can only be like us if you know, they, they totally actually changed their flesh, right? And part of it is, was circumcision. Um, and to that, Paul says, if you think that your skin has to look a certain way, then you don't, then you're not, you haven't quite, it hasn't, you, ha you haven't quite understood why Jesus came. You know, so if you look at it that way, he's saying, it's not about our skin. Flesh can be a little confusing. Just think about skin. It's, don't live according to the skin. Live according to the spirit. It's on the inside that counts. It's the heart. It's the soul. Um, that's what makes you a child of God, not, not your ethnic group. Um, and the spirit doesn't, you know, make us a slave. Again, you have a connection back to race, um, but a spirit of adoption, right? None of us because you, you do have that issue of chosenness. You know, is one group of people chosen above others? And, and to that, Paul says, no, it's, it's the spirit. We're all adopted, you know. Um, that's what baptism is about. It's, it's the same as being adopted into this chosen 
race, this chosen family. It's a spiritual thing. So that all of us can look to God and say, that's our father, right? Every tribe, every language. Um, it's the spirit bearing witness, you know, that we are, we are all children of God. And if we are all children, then we're all heirs. We all get the same inheritance. Eternal life, salvation, forgiveness of sins. And, you know, you got to throw this in. We also inherit the suffering. <laughs> right? If, you re <laughs> if we're really going to be honest, we also get the cross. Nobody gets a pass. You know, everybody suffers in their own way. Um, but it's not something we face alone. We face it with our Lord. You know, so, so Paul, Paul was really, you know, he was a missionary. He was about bringing in the outsider. He was about, you know, growing the church. And so he had to deal with, with some of these, these um, issues of skin. You know? mm -hmm. I don't ever remember um, knowing that or thinking that, you know, but like Ingrid said too, it's, and I had commented on that to Sandy. I said, oh, it's a, it's a little um, hard to understand these mm -hmm. particular verses. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the mistake that we make is um, sometimes we, if you don't know that background, sometimes if you just read this, you almost, it almost thinks, it almost appears that Paul's like condemning bodies you know, like physical, you know, like any, anything physical he's against, but that, that's not really true. You know, he's, he's just basically saying, let's, let's look at, at the spirit, you know, that's in each human being. And didn't he also allude to it a little bit? Um, because he apparently had, um, a physical problem. He had, um, you know, some people say, well, you know, would describe what they thought it was. But, um, so I think he brought that part in, too. He had a thorn, a thorn in the flesh. Mm -hmm. A thorn in the flesh. Exactly. And, and, and he goes on to say, it's in our weakness that God's grace is made perfect. And I think we all have a thorn in our flesh. You know, we all have an Achilles heel. Or several, and um, and rather than being ashamed of those, Paul invites us to say, "Hey, maybe that's one of the ways that you experience God's grace." Is if we didn't have any weaknesses, we wouldn't need God. And so, so whenever we're aware of our own failings or weaknesses or shortcomings, it's an opportunity to say, "Look how much I need God." Look how much I need God's grace. And thank God that God is merciful <laughs> to us. Yeah. I think the only, I had started off by saying that I thought it was, um, it could be full of hope, mm -hmm. but if we can be freed of, of God's condemnation here, it says if we suffer with him, so we may be glorified in him. Mm -hmm. So the, the promise is there at the end that we be glorified with him. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's really deep because in the, especially in the Roman culture you know might makes right you got caesar on the top mm -hmm. you got the senators then you have citizens you had non-citizens you had slaves you had women and children i mean it was very there was a, a hierarchy and a pecking order and the mighty roman army exactly all over north northern europe 
right? The cent and the centurions Comfort. were the cream yep. of the cream, creme a la creme. Yep. Mm -hmm. Creme a la creme. And if you Lots suffered, if you had a disease or you suffered or you were poor, it was all seen as God's judgment and condemnation. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a slave, you must have done something to, to deserve being a slave. That's, that's your lot in life. And Jesus turns the whole thing upside down because he suffered and died on a cross, the most shameful form of Roman persecution. Being crucified was like not a big deal. It's what they did to common criminals. You get a couple pieces of, of wood, you nail them together, boom, take care of business. And so when the disciples went through that trauma of that happening to their rabbi, the whole point that Paul keeps going back to is to say, therefore, when you suffer, it does not mean that God has rejected you. Because Jesus suffered and he was perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's really turning the whole Roman hierarchy upside down. It's very disruptive. <clears throat> and some, it's, it's, an open, it's an open debate among historians. Did, Christian, did Christianity cause the fall of Rome? Of Roman Empire, yeah. And that, that will be argued forever. Some people would say, no, Christianity revived it and gave it another however many years. Others would say, no, it actually caused the downfall. Um, and, and you can see that tension right here in this reading. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is, yeah, whenever we read Paul and Romans, it, it gets very deep, very, very quickly. Totally, yeah. yeah. But I do find it comforting. I find it comforting because, you know, it means that it's not about me having a, a perfect body or perfect flesh or being a perfect person. It's, it's me being adopted by God. God's chosen me, even with my weaknesses, just as he's chosen each of you. And just as he wishes to choose every human being, you know, and that's why we, we, we look to faith. You know, our mission really is, is, is faith. We want people to have faith. Faith that, that God loves them that much. I believe that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other thoughts on Romans or should we read the gospel? Read the gospel. Okay, here we go. And this is a, this is a good one. John 3, 1 through 17. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, 
that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Praise to you, Christ. Christ. Amen. John 3.16, the Gospel in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, we, all, we all grew up learning that. We do. Yeah. And if you grew up learning 16, you know, 17 is kind of worth memorizing too. It's sort of like mm -hmm. the safety check. You know, occasionally John, John 3, 16 is, is, is bread, it's life, it's water, it's, you know, it's grace. It's about Jesus coming and saving us. Sometimes though, people might get a little confused and they kind of turn it into a, a bat to hit someone. You know, they'll say, unless you believe in Jesus, you know, you're not saved, you know, kind of boom. And, and 17 just kind of helps us remember, Jesus didn't come to condemn, he came to save, right? right. And that's where we, we want people to have faith in Jesus, we do. Um, but it's always the invitation. You know, it's always the, the grace and the love that we give. And we hope that eventually, you know, that, that faith is there. Jesus is, is life and, and a savior and a, and a loving one, not, not the one that, come, that came to condemn. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, interesting when we <clears throat> talk about our obligation, our commission, because I have a, um, a lady in our neighborhood, just two doors up, that's a very strong Christian. And she told me the other day that she tried to talk to the man that lives at the cul-de-sac that I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that um, had a brain tumor and now prostate. And she said she tried to talk to him and he just panned her off completely. And she said, now when he sees her, he won't join in a conversation with her. Mm. Oh dear. Here's a, man, here's a man that's basically has a very poor prognosis. And Connie is not an aggressive person, but she probably would say, you know, this is important in your life. And, mm -hmm. and um, he totally refused it. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Those, the, the, it, we, yeah, exactly. How do we evangelize? in a way that doesn't turn people away. You know. Yeah. Well, and, and you see that in the stories. We get so focused on these verses that sometimes we forget the, the context, you know, and I know Sandy, you like the context, which I appreciate. And the context here is this guy, this fellow, Nicodemus, Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. and he was a Pharisee and the Pharisees, you know, what do we know about the Pharisees, at least in the new Testament? Any, anyone kind of want to share? Um, well, kind of an elite educated group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I little, would say, mm -hmm. say somewhat feared and, mm -hmm. um, I assume they had power, but tell me if I'm wrong. Yes, they had power. I think they would have been seen as elite because they were the educated class. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I wouldn't say this in a sermon, but I'll say it in a Bible study. <laughs> Kind of maybe a little how we look at maybe like left-leaning liberals today. And, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. L someone who's a left-leaning liberal could be criticized as being elite, 
right? The university academia ivory tower, you know, left leaning. Um, it's a similar kind of dynamic. Um, and I, and I say that not in judgment, but to say there was also good there, right? Because of, of the people in my life who would identify as liberal, I often see them as wanting to, you know, the wanting to maybe reform, you know, or try to make things better. There was that element to the Pharisees. They were not like bad people, right? They were, um, part of what the Pharisees did was they would take the Old Testament laws and they would try to adapt them to a modern context. So they would say, okay, it says in the Torah, you know, um, on the 15th day after this, you got to do this. And, and they would take that and they would say, well, what it really means is, you know, you should do this. So they, they were not, um, that's why I'm saying they were not necessarily seen as conservative. Your conservatives would have been more of the, of the Sadducees and the temple leadership. They wanted to preserve the traditions where you come to temple, you make your sacrifice, you do it exactly as it says. And the Pharisees, they would, they would study it and interpret it. And um, are, is it making sense what I'm saying or, or did I lose mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, so well, then you're you saying that. I'm sorry, Pastor. Go, no, no, go ahead, please. Allow me to interject. While you were saying this, I was thinking, you know, it even applies to today because Christianity, we have all these different spectrums of Christian churches. Yes. And some churches, they're like the Sadducees. Right. This is it. You mm -hmm. cannot move from it. And, and we look at it and say, really? Mm -hmm. And... Um, then we have the Pharisees. I feel like that's more like us. We're adapting. And when you said they look over the Quran, I was thinking of the council, how you adapt with everything, um, the laws, yeah. you know, and, and mission statements and so forth and so on. So this is what I related it to as well. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's good. I mean, that's, that's kind of how I look at it too. And like, you know, like you could think of a Pharisee, you know, sort of like I, I have colleagues who are, you know, Christian pastors who are just very, very um, progressive, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like if I were to admit that I eat red, red meat, you know, that I'm not a vegan, they kind of like judge me a little bit, you know, like really you, you know, you, you should know better. You should be eating organic only you know, free range vegetables or whatever. I, I'm joking a little bit, but that was kind of the Pharisee. Let me know when you find free range vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. But you, you, you know, you probably have people like that in your life, you know, where yeah. they, they try to do, they try to be so on the leading edge yeah. that you're kind of feeling like you're being judged by them sometimes. Right. You know, and that's, I think that's kind of the Pharisees, you know, they were trying so hard to, to show people the, the righteous way to live. that sometimes it was like, you know, gosh, can't you just relax once in a while? Um, and you, and you get that with Nicodemus, you know, he comes to Jesus and he's just so rigid, you know, he's like, um, he, he can tell that there's something about Jesus that interests him, but he takes everything that Jesus says so literally. You know, Jesus says, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, how can you be born again after you're grown old? Are you going to go in your mother's room and be born? You know, oh my goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, Jesus is like, you just really, you know, come on, be a little bit flexible. <laughs> yeah. here. Think about it. Yeah. Um, some people have even thought that Jesus might have been educated by Pharisees as a young man. Um. Hmm his knowledge of the Bible and the fact that he was a rabbi, 
um, some, it, it's just speculation. I don't think you could prove it, but some have speculated that he was educated by Pharisees. You know, if he was a young man that showed talent, um, son of a carpenter, but you can go to do your Sabbath school. And, um, and then he broke away. He broke away. And, um, and, and he wasn't satisfied with, with every, the way that they did things. And, and, you know, he did, did his, his own ministry as he was called by God. I think the rabbi didn't want to be seen either because he made it a point of coming at night. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. He came at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he was probably, like you said, very well educated, probably a leader. And so for him to be associating with Jesus, who was, you know, more controversial, a more controversial figure, you know, he, he came at night. And, and you see the connections back to Romans, you know, where Paul, Paul is struggling to, to take this Jesus movement and, and share it with the whole world and all ethnic groups you have the same thing happening here where Jesus is challenging Nicodemus. Look, it's not about how you were, were born physically. It's about how have you been born spiritually, which is why, you know, we have born again Christians. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. You know, if people want to talk about being born again, you know, we don't talk about that a lot as Lutherans, but I don't... It kind I, of died down, too, that kind of movement. Yeah. You know, it was very prominent in the 70s and 80s, and then it started to peter out. Yeah. yeah. Because I haven't been nothing in the last 20 years. I haven't heard about it, nothing. Right. It's kind of mellowed out. I mean, at one time I was being asked by... My mother's husband said uh, his mother, if I was a born again Christian, and I was here visiting from Omaha in the early 70s, and I looked at her dumbfounded. I said, Excuse me, I'm a Lutheran, German Lutheran. I was baptized as a baby, so that's enough. Yeah. And she didn't have any comeback right. to say, <laughs> you know, so. And, and that's, that's it, that's baptism. So, um, why did she think you were born again? What did she mean by she that? She asked me. No, she asked me if I, if I was a born again Christian. Why, why did she think that? I, I have no idea because she was a strict born again Christian. Oh. You know, that's the first time I heard about it. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Are you kidding me? I'm from the Midwest, you know. <laughs> so, so, and I, I just told her, I said, I'm a Lutheran, German Lutheran. And I was baptized when I was a child. And that's enough for me. Thank you. And that shut her up. Yeah. yeah. Little old lady there. Yeah. <laughs> and she probably knew you had strong opinions so that you would give her a strong answer. That might, that might have come across. In my 70s, I tell you, in the early 70s, cheapers. Anyway. You're great. <laughs> and and we, would, we would point to our baptism as our second birth. That's exactly mm -hmm. what we would do with our theology. Um, and therein lies the debate. Some Christians would say, they would. Some, some Christians would say, doesn't count. Doesn't count until you are at an age where you can make that decision on your own. And we just kind of agree to disagree on that one. Um, right. I, I could see why they would say that, but where the reason why we do infant baptism is because we say ultimately that second birth is about God choosing me. God chooses me even before I can choose God. And that's the most important thing is that God chooses us and, and we are born anew because of God's grace. Other thoughts on that? Loretta, Sandy?
I thought it was a good story, Ingrid, that you you told a very personal story of your family because I, I a lot of people go through that. A lot of people yeah. will have those moments where someone will ask <laughs> them, you know, and it's like, well, what do I say? Well, that was my <clears throat> excuse me, spirited, immediate answer to that. I, yeah, and and I I think <laughs> of, I, I think you answered well, and I think the especially the baptism, you know, the note on <laughs> baptism, right. we, we really look to that as a, as a sacrament. And then today, I think it's the baptism, the Baptists and the Mormons that uh, baptize their children later in the years, right? Eight, nine, ten, something like that. Uh, definitely Baptists. I don't know about Mormons. Yeah. yeah, Church, yeah of, well, Church of Christ. Yeah. Church of Christ does too. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I was baptized as an adult, um, and when my sister was Catholic for her husband, which was when she was 80, um, excuse me, we could not find any record that we were ever baptized, and we couldn't believe that because my parents were Christian and they went to, you know, we always went to church. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't know that I was ever baptized as a child. Yeah. So, wow. <laughs> And so my sister had to be baptized in the Catholic Church because they wouldn't accept her unless she'd been baptized, of course. Yeah. So when she changed over, she also was baptized. Yeah. And I was baptized um, while Loretta was there. So I, was, yeah. I wasn't a spring chicken. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Sandy's baptism was wonderful. Yeah. It was wonderful. It's something I never, never, ever forgot because yeah. it was very meaningful. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, my husband, my daughter, and I were all, and a friend were all baptized together, and, and other people also. Yes, that sounds wonderful. And 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 you know what? There's never a bad time to be baptized. Yeah. Right? right. Right. Adult, teenager, child, baby. Never too just late. get baptized. Never too late. <laughs> never too early, and never too late. Yeah. It's exactly. Just, it's always a good time. Yeah, and you know, my daughter was baptized, of course, as an infant in the Lutheran Church. And then when she was in Heidelberg, um, and of course, she went to church there, and it was Church of Christ. Um, and so she was rebaptized. Mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. called and told me, and I said, Oh, you should have told me. And she said, I knew that you would have said, You have already been baptized here. <laughs> so. So she was doubly baptized, but Church of Christ is very adamant about that. So my granddaughters were baptized as young adults. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Church of Christ is the one where it's uh, no instruments, just singing? No instruments, but they have wonderful voices. They do. And then occasion, and Karen was um, married in that church, but I said, well, we're going to have music, and they allowed music. So. Mm. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of respect for Church of Christ. Um, our neighbors in Sedona were Church of Christ. And when my we were living there, my mom broke her hip. Um, you know, a lot of the neighbors would say, well, let us know if you need anything, which was nice. The neighbors who were Church of Christ showed up with food. We didn't ask. They just started bringing it over and they kept bringing it over until we, if we had to say that we have enough the fridge is full but they literally would have kept doing it until we asked them to stop hmm. and i'll never forget that i mean they didn't it just that's evangelism right that's evangelism um mm -hmm. they just cared for us in our moment of need and uh that was really amazing you know <clears throat> so there you have it holy trinity okay. sunday okay and, and i remember the red flags are still up so i'm gonna have to make a call okay sandy you, you saw them on sunday yes right yes was, we did I was, I was telling sandy something about that i said you know so yeah they're beautiful yes all right, well, let's pray. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, you. with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you, Sandy, Ingrid, Loretta, and June for being at Bible study today. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, thank you Pastor. Pastor. So few I'm glad you, you do so well with our ladies. <laughs> yeah.